Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Store and Coach here at Tactical Hive. In today's video, we're going to be doing a deep dive into uh, the men, weapons, and equipment used on a specific operation. Uh, there's, you know, plenty to choose from, so we thought we'd start off strong, and that was with Operation Nimrod, which was the uh, hostage rescue at the Iranian Embassy in London in 1980. Yeah, 1980, long time ago. And you got to remember, these guys were tactical pioneers. You know, there wasn't off-the-shelf stuff to deal with, uh, you know, the, the environment that they were going to put themselves in. So we're going to look into how they adapted, what they were doing, and, uh, you know, how they made things happen. Yeah, how they made it happen. Hey guys, today's video is brought to us by CCW Safe. You know, if you carry a weapon and intend to use it, God forbid, for self-defense or the defense of others, you know, good luck, but uh, you can count on that second fight coming. There's going to be that legal process, and CCW Safe has that down to his science. They will handpick your legal team and send out an independent investigator to work on your behalf if need be, which uh, is something I would definitely want. So check them out in the description below. Let's get into it. All right, guys, so brief history of Operation Nimrod, which took place between 30 April and 5 May of 1980. It was a six-day siege that was pulled off by Iranian Arabs that were Iraqi-funded. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they had their reasons, who cares? Right. So these six Iranian militants stormed the embassy, took 26 hostages, mm -hmm. and held on to them, made their demands, and it took six days for, uh, you know, things to progress. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the SAS then took them down. Cool. But before we get too far into that, we're going to back it up a little bit. Um, you know, special operations have been around for a long time. You know, the SAS had been around since World War II. They're kind of, a, again, the pioneers of what we consider to be that capability. But it was just more efficient, better, faster soldiering mm -hmm. up to this point, you know. What really happened, you know, a decade prior to that, the 1970s, was terrorism. And we're talking about, you know, Arab terrorism specifically. And what brought that to the forefront of Western civilization was the 1972 Munich massacre, yeah. which is where a bunch of Palestinians basically walked into the Olympic village. They did have to hop a fence in the, in, in the Olympic committee's defense. They were able to take 11 Israeli athlete hostages and uh, they killed two of them right off the get-go, and eventually, you know, the total was all 11 perished. Yeah, and the big thing was during the rescue attempt is when everybody else died. So, you know, you can't have a successful hostage rescue when all the hostages die. So a lot of things were exposed during that operation mm -hmm. that uh, didn't work. So they learned a lot of lessons, and of course, everything's, you know, paid for in blood. But this is the, the the next big one was this, and this yeah. is kind of what they were uh, they had been um, working with, working towards, uh, and this was the first time they got to exercise that. So in the aftermath of that failed rescue attempt, that really kind of established what we now know to be you know the big budget dedicated counterterrorism teams. So you saw the Germans um, come out with their GSG nine, uh, the French follow suit with GIGN. And, but they were both police agents, yeah, it's not military. They were, but honestly, they, they don't uh, see it the same way over there. Yeah, they are technically like a, a, a law, a state-sponsored law enforcement yeah. you know, entity. You know, in the aftermath, obviously, they did a big investigation. They looked where the, the shortfalls were. And that was really kind of the beginning of, you know, establishing those big budget counter-terrorist teams that we all know and love today. So the Germans, obviously, it happened on their turf, so they immediately stood up GSG-9. The French followed with GIGN. But the British and the Americans just kind of went to their... Well, they turned to their unconventional forces. They've yeah. been doing things unconventionally. The army, went, both went to the army, and of course that's where we got... I mean, the SES were already, you know, established and quite capable, so they kind of stood up their counter-revolutionary wing. And that was just kind of their way of saying, you know, hostage rescue, direct action capability to deal with these kinds of shenanigans. So because the SAS was a smaller portion of the army, highly specialized or highly uh, adaptable, um, they're the ones that were tasked to figure things out and, and make this new capability work. 
So I mean, they're able to, on a smaller scale, procure pretty much any weapon they wanted to at the time uh, and, and, and press it into service. Alrighty guys, so starting off the list, you know, we gotta go with the one, the only, the MP5A3. Uh, MP5A3, it's a, uh, it's a German submachine gun. It's iconic now, everybody knows. Um, but at the time, it was groundbreaking. The thing is, you know, the operating system, delayed roller locking, so it's, it's lighter, uh, it's less recoil. The thing works awesome. I probably have about a million rounds shot through one because, hell, I used, we were still using them when I got to SEAL Team 6 in the mid-90s. Um, the thing is, it's it ultimately reliable, although, well, one of the guys had an issue. Now, yeah, got to remember, guys, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. But this particular weapon system was, um, it was the, the best thing in the world at the time. Yeah, there was nothing better that could beat this. Uh, and after they used it, after it showed up, uh, like, you know, on the 6 o'clock news, everybody who was anybody in the counter-terrorist world had an MP5. All right, so MP5. Um, let's back it up a little bit farther to uh, 1977. And uh, there was a plane that was taken over, again, by terrorists. You know what kind. And it was flight 181. It was a Lufthansa flight. And it ended up landing in Somalia. So GSG-9 were already in Germany. They just followed the plane until it landed, hopped out of their plane, and just took this thing down. And Which was pretty awesome. But... Uh, there were a few SAS guys embedded with them, and they, um, you know, did their after-action report. And what one thing that they picked up on was that terrorists that were engaged with pistols didn't always die right away. They needed to be further engaged, which takes time, and that's incredibly dangerous. But all of the guys that were dropped with MP5s went down and stayed down, and they took note of that <laughs> back to Hereford, uh, England, where they're from. And that's how the MP5 was adopted into SAS service. They got to see it in action, and it was a game changer. All right, guys, so by the time of the siege, the MP5A3, or what the Brits called the uh, L91A1, because, you know, everyone's got to have their own freaking title for everything, which is fine. Uh, those were adopted and basically the uh, flagship mainstay weapon for these types of operations. So MP5Ks and SDs were also in the inventory by this time and saw limited use as needed. And that carried on, man, because, you know, even in the you know, mid 90s, you know, we were running with uh, the MP5N mm -hmm. and we had Ks and SDs that were, you know, not everybody had one there that that for that niche, uh, you know, uh, mission yeah and then by the time i came around in the mid 2000s the ends were phased out for the uh the 10 inch cqbr you know m4 variants but those k's and sds stayed in the uh, inventory for like another decade and they were pulled out and used for niche purposes same as it ever was so the a3 version basically the same gun i grew up with but it didn't have that trilog adapter so you could just throw a uh, a suppressor on uh and the early ones had a stick mag it was like straight and but by the time they got to uh in 1980 they pretty much all of them were had that that nice curve to them which is a more reliable yeah, uh, form the, of, uh, of feeding and it's the same one we have yeah same day, one now. as far as i know so you know i did a lot of research geeking out nerding out in not complaining that's who i am that's what it is but uh it was said and i saw conflicting reports that some of the assaulters used sds and k's in place of the a3 standard because there weren't enough of them and i mean we the initial introduction to the weapon system that we spoke to during the plane takedown was in 1977 so they had the better part of three years to get these things they've got a very good budget and there aren't very many sas guys to begin with so i don't think that's likely you know i don't know for sure but um, I think the SEs and Ks were probably just used more for still in that niche. Yeah, you know, niche or so. honestly personal preference. Yeah, yeah. Because I, mean, I carried an SD for a while yeah. just because I wanted to. Because honestly, nobody ever told me to carry an MP5. I just did it because I wanted to. <laughs> and hey, when you're in a small specialized <laughs> unit, sometimes just because you want to is is okay. You know, yeah. you, you pull what's in there. As long as it makes sense. Wall. Yeah. yeah, if you can make it make sense, you know, at least to your chief anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The big guy. Yeah. <laughs> Something interesting though that we did find nerding out 
on this, something that I didn't know, and I'm surprised because, you know, I like guns and MP5s and stuff, <laughs> but uh, the original MP5 SDs uh, didn't have that kind of uh, enlarged, robust forward hand grip that we all know. The, uh, the gun was just kind of one continuous streamlined forend, and, um, you know, maybe if you haven't shot an SD, but you have shot other suppressed weapons, like the ST gets just as hot as any of them. Maybe hotter. Yeah, maybe know. hotter. I mean, this, the thing gets crazy hot and um, not having anything there to protect your hand. I mean, after about a mag, even on semi-auto, like, I mean, that thing is going to be s scorching. So I thought I found that kind of interesting. I don't think it took very long after this um, operation for HK to have uh, fixed that, which you know you see that larger. Yeah, I understand in that picture. I didn't know exactly what that guy was doing because I tried that on mine. I didn't like that big bulky round, mm -hmm. you know, cover. So I pulled it off and <laughs> went to the range one time. I was like, okay, that sheet metal that heated up real quick. So I went and uh, took that same bulky round ribbed. Uh, uh, you know, foregrip, and I cut my own checkering into it. And then that way, uh, my hand didn't slip quite as much and it didn't get burnt. So I ran with that for, you know, most of that year, I think. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, you know, by the time I deployed, you know, obviously we needed rails and all that stuff. But um, on my first deployment, we didn't have rails for them yet. So my chief, uh, Ty Woods, just clamped, similar to what these guys were doing at this time, you know, the same DIY. Those meeting. clamps were, guys. Yeah, he clamped the tri rail off of an M4 CAC rail onto the bottom of it with a foregrip, a laser, and a light. And that one just stayed in the, the arms room, and we would pull it out and use it as need be. And uh, yeah, it worked great. Yeah, I just, you know, we didn't have lasers for yeah. the damn things, uh, but I uh, I hose clamped a, uh, a flashlight to the suppressor on mine. So yeah, hose clamps work, man. They're, they're nice. if you got to clamp something on there, it'll work. And then eventually they uh, they came out with dedicated rails for them. Yeah. And all, after that, that's all we all had. That all that fancy them. stuff. Yeah, that, and uh, now they've got M block and blah, blah, blah. But you know, back then they didn't have any of that stuff. They just made it work. But I just thought it was interesting that HK actually sold a suppressed weapon with no like heat shield like <laughs> like wow but uh, you know they got to figure it out and uh, we only have this one picture that was taken on the roof I guess with red team and uh, yeah I just thought it was pretty cool mm -hmm. so now looking through all these pictures you're gonna find that uh, there's it's you have the originals where they're taken off of the, uh, the the news footage, and then you've got a bunch of stage stuff afterwards. Mm -hmm. So picking out the, the gear, I mean, they, they swapped some stuff up to make them look mm -hmm. better um, as it went along. So we really had to like deep dive and get out the magnifying glass and like, okay, is that does that make sense? Is that the you know you we were looking at the uh, the news feed uh, pictures are they're the only ones you can go by, and honestly, the the resolution <laughs> ain't that good. Yeah, so. We're doing our best here. Yeah, it, this, you know, was a springboard into the innovation and, and for equipment. You know, that's, as far as weapons and equipment go, you know, this one occurrence, this one op, probably did more to, you know, develop, further develop and get the industry really going into these types of operations. Because as we get further into this, like, I mean, they're just making it work with what they had. Yeah, I mean, case in point, the flashlight, okay, which was a Streamlight SL20. And we can basically figure out a way to, uh, to, to modify the uh, uh, the clamp on mount, mm -hmm. and they just hose clamped a, a, a light to it. And from what I understood, they kind of uh, lined it up so that the hot spot, you know, you get, you know, mag lights and stream lights have a big spill and a hot spot in the middle, and they kind of figured out that's where your group was going to go. So. You light it up, you turn the light on, and that's projecting yeah. out there. That hot spot was where your round's gonna go. And I mean, that's genius for the time. Um, but I mean, you know, seven years later, we're still running around with full size freaking mag lights, hose clamped in a tray on our MP5s. You know, it, it took a while for um, technology to catch up and be able to make flashlights as small as they are now. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. and the first little light we got, it was like 60 lumens. We're like, wow, this is really cool. And now, geez, you got, you know, 1200 and something really small. So it was, um, 
I don't know how many lumas they have, but I just know how much it hurts my eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh, this one, this one. Ah! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the only gauge yeah. for success that I have. Yeah. Back then, I'm sure that was, yeah, even those big ones had like maybe 60 lumens. So yeah. you, weren't, you weren't causing the pain that you want to cause when you shine a light in somebody's eyes. Mm-hmm. You know, now, yeah, you know, I, I put a weapon light on everything you know, that I'm going to carry with because when I put it on you, you're going to be going, ah, that hurts, not, oh, look, the light, I should shoot at it. And, mm-hmm. yeah. But just, you know, like the fact that they were able to weaponize a light, not only to for the illumination purposes, but they just the way that they thought, and this is so long ago, mm-hmm. that they used it for targeting. They would focus that beam in and, you know, basically give them a general idea of where their rounds were going to land, just like Coach mentioned. But... You know, for those of you that have used, um, you know, nods and IR illuminators, imagine just using the focused flood without the laser to engage with. Like, that's what they were doing. And uh, that's pretty well, cool. In their defense, dude, the, the, the lasers in yeah. 1980 were about the same size as the damn flashlight. Yeah, they weren't so, using lasers were at all. Huge. But um, <laughs> but they were still able to, like, not only, yeah, we need to be able to see, but what's the point of seeing something if we can't engage it? So they would actually, like, use the light, focus the beam, and sight in the light for target acquisition. Well, I thought that was pretty sick. And at that point, if, if you're, you can't really see your, your irons at that point. On the day, guys, they were using the uh, the standard HK three-point sling. Um, those were, you know, that's what they had going on. I've used them a little bit, messed around with them, especially on MP5s, and they work, yeah. you know? Yeah, they're a little more complex than what you need, but uh, yeah. yeah. But honestly, you know, they were using that sling tension method. Which you, know. you can do with just a, you know, yeah. single point, but... Uh, yeah, I mean the the way the the three point thing works is it has a little clip, yeah. You know, so you can clip it, and make it nice and short. So if you've got to go do something with two hands, it's right here. You can grab it, pop it off of there, and then just press out. Oh. They're due for a resurgence. Yeah, they're due for a retro <laughs> comeback. <clears throat> we'll see. All right, guys. So up next, we've got the uh, Browning High Power, which is a nine by nineteen service pistol. It's known as the, uh, the HP or the BHP 35. That's because it first entered service in 1935, making it ahead of its time to say the least. I mean, this thing is a double action trigger pull away from being a Super 9 in the 1980s. <laughs> yeah. And it came out in 35. And it was developed even lo- way before that. Um, but John Moses Browning died and it took a while for it to uh, get finished. And it ended up being finished by the Z Belgians. And it's, I think, the most successful American platform in Europe. I would say that's that's a correct statement. Yeah, it never really was able to uh, surpass the 1911 on our side of the pond. But, uh, man, they took and ran with it. The British and Germans actually fought each other in World War II, both issuing that gun. Yeah. That does not happen very often (laughs) outside of, like, you know, the AK. At the time, the 1911 was was considered high capacity because it held, held more than six. You know, you had six in a cylinder with your revolver, mm. and hey, you get you know seven or eight in that damn uh, uh, 1911. Yeah. But 13, you know, in a standard magazine for your uh, Browning high power. I mean, honestly, that's that's firepower right yeah. there. And by 1980, the Browning high power was the British Commonwealth's go-to pistol, and uh, the BSAS just ran with them because they worked and they had ammunition commonality between their primary and secondary weapon system, which is always a great thing to have. Uh, something that has never caught on in America, <laughs> but um, you know that's okay. Well, I know we were running with it when I first got the damn mag for CQB. Oh, okay, nine mil pistol and a nine mil. Uh, in general, yeah, but uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, you're right. We had that. Totally wrong. But you know, you know, a niche is what we're talking about here. But I never just I unless I was using that MP5 for that niche purpose, it just never worked out for us because it was five, five, six, nine mil, and then yeah, back in the. Our, you know, at this time, everybody was running 1911. Yeah, on our side. But of honestly, for this time, um, that Browning High Power was probably the best pistol yeah. in the world. You know, for that highest capacity, um, you know, and and very reliable. Yeah, and been around for a number of years at that point, and it was the the, the forerunner to all that your uh, your cool Tupperware you know Wonder Nines that we have now. And so, you know, standard issue across their force, but the SAS did use them. They called them the L9A1. Of course. And you got to throw in that L. 
And, that's that's uh, for land. land. Yeah, not loss. These are winners. <laughs> Let's be clear. <laughs> land forces is where the U.S. military uses M for model. If you see an L in front of uh, anything British, it's that was the Army's uh, you know version. Yeah. So, you know, 13 round capacity, but in the SAS, they went with a 12 round SOP just for, you know, reliability issues, which was not uncommon for the time. Spring technologist wasn't what it was. And a lot of guys still do that now with your uh, your uh, M4 magazines, yeah. you know, just so you can load on uh, with the bolt forward just makes it easier. Yeah. Any, anytime we were ever using like the aluminum GI mags, it was always 28. Sometimes though, sometimes I'd cheat and I'd put in 29, <laughs> you know? Yeah, you rebel. Yeah, but um, yeah, it just it just helps. So yeah, this, so they had custom in-house built 20 round magazines. And uh, this is, I think the first instance we know of, but we could be wrong, of a high capacity pistol mag. They generally only ran one on the gun and then had, you know, anywhere from two to four additional mags of 12, not 13 mm -hmm. uh, to go. And uh, man, I just pretty much gave them, I mean, they had a, a cap ammo capacity of a four mags, 120 rounds for the MP5, and then anywhere from three to five pistol mags. It's a lot of nine millis. Mm -hmm. A lot of freedom seeds, you know, <laughs> to spread. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Potential mayhem. Up next, guys, we have sniper rifles, and this is where we kind of uh, run into a little bit of problems. Not much is known exactly which um, recce rifles they had out there but that we know of. They didn't end up taking any shots uh, with sniper rifles, though the snipers did implement gas as needed with their launchers. But um, as far as sniper rifles that the SES would have had available to them, I mean, arguably they could have had anything under the sun that they wanted. But, you know, based on uh, what other units were doing, at, at the time so starting off you know obviously the british military's go-to precision rifle was the l42a1 which is just an accurized modernized better uh lee enfield yeah uh, it was chambers yeah seven chambers 762 nato because that was a thing by then but it was bolt action and uh again going back to the 72 olympic massacre they weren't able to kill the palestinians fast enough due to the bolt action you yeah. know and how much you know, how true that is or not I, you know i couldn't tell you but it is it's hard to do you know you got to come off manually redo it uh, usually it's going to be slower no matter yeah, what it, it, it just is there's no way around it i mean obviously you know that but um so semi-automatic precision weapons to out to at least medium engagement distances was a must you know we look at the semi-automatic versions of, of what was available yeah. for semi automatic. What, what could have what could that guy had on the roof right yeah and keep in mind that you know the distance that these um recce observation units would have been at in regards to the building was at most 100 well probably 100 yards so they did launch gas through windows yeah yeah so well, i got that, gas mask. i know so that, that must have been if they were able to yeah. hit a window with a grenade launcher mm -hmm. they were close yeah they were definitely close and honestly they could only see it from two sides because the building the embassy was adjoined with a bunch of other embassies and offices yeah so you know these these were not long shots so could they have used an accurized version of the uh, l1a1 which is a you know british made fin foul of course did they have pretty easy to use low uh, magnification optics all ready to go yes they did and they had them in their inventories we know that because they used that platform as their main battle rifle during other types of operations so you know that could have been it um, also you know we had the um, again after Munich one of the first things that was adopted was the HK PSG 1 which was a brand brand new piece of kit and that is basically a highly accurized rifle based on the G3 platform. Yeah, which I think they were pressed that one into service um, shortly after, like in 73, I think. It's like, well, they figured that out. It's like, okay, yeah, we need something that and this, we can get rapid secondary shots off of. Yeah, and this thing was arguably like the most advanced purpose built for tactical precision shooting weapon system of all time, or up until uh, up that until time. Then, yeah, definitely. So I'm assuming that's what they had. Mm -hmm. uh, though I can't fully confirm. Well, then there there was other the H and K um, SG one, right. which is one step down from that. It's an mm -hmm. accurized G three. Yeah, but, it would be kind of a halfway point between the PSG one, the G three, kind of like the uh, the M twenty one over here. We had the M fourteens and then the M twenty ones. Yeah, um, and they were just refined 
better trigger, better barrel. I want one. <laughs> <laughs> so all four were chambered in 7.62 NATO, which again would have been plenty of uh, round to deal with man-sized threats at those distances. So. Yeah, most of your sniper stuff was done in 7.62 mm -hmm. at, at the time. Yeah, even your, you know, accurized bolt actions, you know, forever were, you know, Helen, even into the late 90s, uh, we're still, we still had those in the inventory as well as, you know, stepping up to uh, 300 wind mag. Mm -hmm. But for the most part in that time, yeah, snipers were shooting 7.62. All right, guys, up next, knives. That's right, sharp pieces of metal. They, uh, they, they play around these types of things. You gotta have them. They're pretty much on every gear list, and yep. sometimes uh, they're even a requirement that people check to make sure you have. So yeah, obviously- Sharp and not rusty. Yes, <laughs> yes. The, uh, obviously, the standard knife that we all know associated with SAS is gonna be that Fairburn Sykes mm -hmm. um, dagger which is their most iconic piece of kit up to this point, seeing as they didn't operate in their tan berets. But they also had a different knife that we did, honestly didn't know anything mm -hmm. about that was uh, very prominent in their kit. They had them up high, either on their vests or on their uh, shoulder sleeve. Yeah, sewn, sewn yeah, on the shoulder. Sewn right in. Or on the, uh, either on the vest or on the sleeve. I've seen them both. And again, it's hard to tell. And personal preference comes into this, guys. I mean, you know, where you sew your knife, mm -hmm. where I carried my knife, was not where he carried his knife. Um, you know, of course you're going to bring your, your cool Fairburn Sykes because it's cool. I mean, that's, that's, that's your, you know, your assassin dagger, right? It doesn't, it's not a real good utility knife, but boy, it's made for, uh, for poking flesh, right? So I'd say pretty much everybody was going to carry one of those. It's, they don't weigh very much and hell, you never know. Right? We hope so. Your SAS, baby. We like to believe it. But honestly, the, the knife they probably used more was the air crew survival knife that you see sewn on either the, uh, the shoulder or the kit. And these are pretty cool because uh, they've got the, the scabbard is metal and it's bent just a little bit, has a little uh, uh, post that sticks out that you, you stick the knife in there and clip it onto that post and it's got these little pressure, uh, what do you call them, tabs. Mm -hmm. the, you would squeeze those and it would them. pop out and now you've got a knife in your hand. And that's the one you're gonna use for cutting away, you know, curtains and, you know, or whatever else. Yeah, the, that's the one you're gonna go for most of the time. You know, for me, it's, it's a good utility knife. It's got a slightly curved blade and it was like uh, sharpened on the inside curve. Mm -hmm. So it made sense for, uh, for what they were using, you know, for, yeah. for, for the need at the time. It was, you know, basically a safety knife that did end up getting used when uh, one of the guys got caught up in his rappel line. Um, and it was just, it was an air crew, um, you know, kind of survival safety knife. It was, you know, RAF standard issue. And I'm um, reading about it, they call it the anti-gravity device that, you know, that that, was that, able that, to clip it in. Okay. That was to defeat gravity for doing, you know, so remember guys, this is before Velcro and Kydex <laughs> and all the cool stuff we have now. Mm -hmm. You know, so they had to use the uh, the technology of the time to actually, uh, you know, make this happen. And the air crew guys had figured this out and they pressed it into service and, you know. And they were the special air out. service. That's that's true. So, so it was, you know, probably just had to go down and ask for them. And Gravity Defiance <laughs> is kind of in the name there. And Gravity Defiance is a big part of the job. Don't discount it, you know? Yeah. And gravity works 100% of the time. Yeah, definitely. All right, guys. Um, up next, we've got uh, flashbangs or stun grenades. On the day, they were using uh, the G60, which operates just like a regular flashbang, only these things were pretty big. Monster. Yeah, I'm looking at the pictures. You know, I think guys only were able to carry about three or four of them, but they looked like they were damn near the size of a smoke grenade. <laughs> and I'm sure they hacked a heck of a wallop. But um, they, yeah, they were called the G60 and uh, they, they were pretty, they were hefty, you know? But that's okay, you don't have to throw them very far. You only gotta get them in, you know, a couple feet into the room, so. And if you get uh, 30 assaulters with three each, that's 90 of them, so mm -hmm. you, that's that's a fair amount of bang. Um, but then again, when our, we were rolling around with the 141s in the 200 round uh, 60 pouch, you mm -hmm. could fit at least a dozen in there. Literally, like yeah. if you didn't, if you didn't like 
you know, keep yourself in check. You could end up be like throwing rice at a wedding. Because <laughs> you know, there were just so many of them. Like, I don't want to carry these back. Yeah. I want to, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, with these old ones, not uh, not so much. You were. Yeah, you're going to be uh, fairly d judicious in your uh, yeah. application. Uh, CNS grenades were also deployed by the assaulters. I'm not sure which ones, but uh, again, they're standard size. Um, they do start fires both the flashbangs and CS grenades, which did happen, you know? A mm. little bit of that going on, but... Um, and it was their SOP at the time, was yeah. gas everything, you know? And since they trained with gas masks in gas, in a gas environment, um, you know, they were used to it. And hopefully, the bad guys that you're throwing gas on, that's the first time they've, they've experienced mm -hmm. that. And the first time you experience CS, it sucks. I mean, it sucks every other time, but man, that first time, that's extra suck, let me tell you. And that, that was, the idea was to distract them from their, uh, their uh, uh, nefarious mission long enough to get in there and take care of them. Yeah, controlled explosions and gas were a big part of how they rolled, you know, it was a big part of their tactics. And, you know, that stuff's all gear dependent, so they were able to get this stuff into the fight and uh, continue. Yeah, we had backed off on the gas use um, mm. quite a lot uh, by the time I got to uh, to training. I mean, when I was at SEAL Team 5 in the uh, oh, mid to late 80s, um, yeah, we uh, we were doing gas all the time. And not with these cool you know, gas masks that you have now that breathe real easy and have blowers and everything else. These had the, the damn uh, cheek filters in them and oh my God, they sucked. Um, but it, the only thing that sucked worse was not having one in the gas cloud. Um, yeah. yeah, and I can't imagine these guys being that much better, but they had a, a, a good respirator on them. So gas masks, these guys use the S6 respirator that was fitted with a single uh, filter canister, and you'd always put that on your non-shooting side. So if you're, you were a right-handed primary shooter, you'd want that uh, canister on the uh, the opposite side and that carries on to this day mm -hmm. you know if you're using canisters if you got blowers even your, your blower comes off the yeah your, you would you attach your, your blower side. to your non-shooting side um, but even with that with the mp5 they really couldn't establish a good sight picture which led to them dropping the uh the butt stocks down and then just using that sling tension mm -hmm. and you know so now there, there's no butt stock sling tension using the flashlight beam as an optic as they make dynamic entry direct to threat on full auto <laughs> <laughs> these guys oh yeah bad asses man because i'm telling you a lot of what i just said would never in a million years be allowed today <laughs> <laughs> these guys were the deal like i'm telling you like you said man they were cutting brush man this yeah. is like they're figuring stuff out <laughs> Out. It's and just the balls on these guys. I just hey, who dares wins, right? Yeah, it's in the motto. Yeah, you know, and if you've got your flashlight on, not everybody had a flashlight though, and you nope. can kind of get a uh, a sight picture. But basically, you're basically point shooting with sling tension with that MP5, yeah. and because of the little recoil, that's that's a viable technique. I've tried it. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah I, I, we've all tried it. We've all messed around when like our bosses are watching. But uh, you know, like it's. Uh, it's really something, the level of skill that it took to do this, you know, because it was really just, and these guys were just like bar brawlers, basically. You know, the, menta the mentality, you know, not to take anything away from them, but it's almost like an innocent couple at, in an alley was being accosted and these guys are coming out of the bar and they just send it. You know, obviously there's a lot more to it than that, but I mean, it's just incredible what they were able to accomplish with this equipment. It was more attitude than, yeah. than skill. At the time, they're developing the skills, but uh, your attitude was, we're winning. Yeah, and not that they weren't amazing shots, because they were, but uh, it's just, I mean, it's just amazing. But anyway, back to the uh, S6 respirator. It came in three sizes. This may sound familiar <laughs> to you. They had S for small, L for large, and then N for, for normal. <laughs> There's nothing yeah. medium about it. You're either normal yeah. or you're too small, or you're too big to be normal. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was kind of funny because I'd never seen that before. Yeah. It's so, just that alone wouldn't fly today. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean normal? What do you mean normal? You mean I'm abnormal? Yeah. So a little bit less about your feelings and a little bit more about, you know, if you are normal, you should at least want to be. I thought that was, uh, that was pretty cool. I'm pretty sure I'm a normal mask, but maybe I'm a large. You know, I think I am a large, actually. I, I'm, I'm sure all of them would kind of, you know, 
fit, you know, like you would expect it to fit. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty funny. A few issues. Something else we uh, ran across during the, uh, the research was the standard way to carry the gas mask when not in use. They didn't have a gas mask pouch or maybe they just didn't want them. They would just kind of pull the mask up onto their non-shooting upper arm and just kind of cinch it down and just kind of have it ready to go. Um, I don't know. I feel like it would take me one or two door entries to slam it onto the door jam and probably scuff the lens. But I don't know. That's just me. They're probably a lot more coordinated than I was. Well, and all, all the the you know footage that we see, they already got the masks on. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're planning on using gas, so you have the mask on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, carrying the mask later. Yeah, why worry about? It? Why crowd up your uh, your belt with a, a giant gas mask pouch if you don't have to? Exactly. But I didn't know if if putting it on the arm was the standard practice across the board training any you know just sop for the assault unit or that's just something they would you know kind of like uh, when you stick your foregrip through your sling on your m4 you know just kind of have it dangle in there you're not going to retain it because it takes time i don't know i just thought that was kind of interesting yeah if you need two hands and no mask and then they also had the hood right that hood that they used in conjunction with the mask and mm -hmm. i think that was cut off of a uh just their their uh, uh, NBC gear, right? Yeah. So their their cam bio cam, their nuclear uh, biological chem, you know, mop gear as we call it now. Mm -hmm. They call them smocks, not jackets. And so that's what they were called, their smocks. And they, uh, yeah, they just would like cut off the top at like the shoulder level, mm -hmm. keep the hood, and then they would stuff that down underneath their assault vest for added protection. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank God, because we had we did have one guy catch on fire on his way through the breach scene. Yeah. So hopefully that... Uh, Keep their fire off your face. Apparently, yeah, even one of them, like, I think the gas mask caught on fire. But anyway, that's later. No, we're talking about gas masks. Okay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, you know, they did try to protect themselves. They did try to, because they knew there were going to be, you know, it would be hard to get into these situations. You got flashbangs, you got gas, you got breaching charges. And those do start fires, and it did. We had one guy, a uh, Sergeant Palmer, mm -hmm. who made entry, <laughs> caught on fire despite what he was wearing, had to tear off his gas mask in a positive CS environment, was able, and then, but I mean, again, these guys, yeah. badasses, they, uh, true, he just continued clearing. He was a team leader, I believe, was able to engage one tango with his Browning high power Oh yeah, in a gassy room. Because yeah, he, he yeah, everything that could go wrong went yeah. wrong with him. He got lit on fire. Mm. He's in a gassy room. Has to tear his gas mask off. Yeah, uh, while he's you know, there's a witness who said he was patting his hair out. Yeah, his you know, hair, was, his on hair was on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, his hair was on fire. It's and he chases down yeah. a bad guy with a grenade and goes to kill him with the MP5. MP5 fails. And he's got to transition to his Browning high power and then smokes the guy with one shot yeah. okay on fire getting gassed transition to pistol drops him with a headshot dude mad respect for that guy and at that point which everything we were always taught because that could happen and that's something we did train for but you stop clearing and let the other guys go forward while you you know get yourself right not sergeant palmer oh no, no sir <laughs> he just <God>. kept going <laughs> he just kept clearing just going for it yep he pushed and, through and then right yeah. about that time you know they, they entered that the next room and their gunshots coming off the room right off of there and so they had to make immediate entry that one hostage who was already killed at that point they entered and i mean he entered yeah. again with his pistol no time to you know yeah. to get his you know primary back up hey he did what he had to do at the time, man. That's, you know, just a badass. Like I said, attitude. Yeah. Yeah, no quit. Running yeah. around with your hair on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know until I started looking into this that that's actually what that is referencing. <laughs> yeah. As an SAS assaulter running around with his hair on fire, landing headshots in a fully gassed up <laughs> environment without his gas mask yeah. on. Uh, I don't know. Might be one of the most uh, definition of badass, badass right things there. that's ever happened. Yeah. And um, yeah, you know, we were taught to, you know, take a, st a step back, let guys get in front, you know, get your gear set back up. But who's to say in the heat of the moment, you know, would you be able to stop? And I think there was only four guys at the time. So yeah, there were more, like more, train. more coming in. Um, you know, they were coming in from all sides, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just, I, 
I mean, it's just amazing. Mad so, respect. Yeah, mad respect. All right, so in addition to the uh, the NBC smock hood, the gas mask, you know, these guys also were known for and did use balaclavas. These things would have been made of Nomex, um, similar to what else they were wearing. But would you have worn a balaclava under your gas mask? Under the gas mask? No. Especially without a blower? No. Yeah, no, me neither. Because that, 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 that's not going to give you a good uh, seal on that one. Yeah. You know, I mean... If you have just, they, they like the ones with the eye and the nose, or you know that the, the mouth nose uh, spot. Ours always just had one big hole, so you could put them, but it's a pain in the ass. Yeah. You know? So and if you got the hood on anyway, I I wouldn't have I wouldn't have doubled up. And had he been wearing, you know, Sergeant Palmer, badass extraordinaire, freaking, uh, had he been wearing the Nomex balaclava, his hair wouldn't have got on fire. Potentially. Potentially. I mean, he's just going right through. We've all done it. Like he's just going right through the the breach. And the thing about Nomex, it doesn't add to the flames, right? Okay, but you still can burn through it. There's no, uh, there's no yeah, but uh, hair on fire yeah, padding. Yeah, out. once you once you pull it off, yeah, he was you know whatever fire was going on there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, got on him and you know still. Yeah, that and just the heat. The added yeah. heat, the added, you know, the sweat for your lenses. You know, these guys didn't have blowers. You know, they were just rocking and rolling with the single canister. Um, yeah. And, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know about the balaclavas. Well, obviously, they were issued balaclavas, just like they were issued goggles, protective goggles, but they just didn't use them because they had the gas mask. Yeah, if you, you got know? a gas mask on, you don't need goggles. You might have a, you know, pouch or something for, like, ah, who knows. But anyway. Know. I um, mean, they also had their, uh, they didn't have flight suits. They had uh, a tanker suit that was no mix as well. The the, the one piece. Yeah, so they ran the, uh, the tank suit. crewman suit. It was black or, you know, a dark color. These were the boys in black. Um, and that's just what they went with. Hopefully, I, I want to say they did it for purely intimidation reasons. But uh, I'm gonna, I don't know. But that's what they went through. They went kind of with um, mostly black everything. You know, Dude, Black was tactical then. I mean, Still hell. Still is. <laughs> <laughs> it was still when I, yeah. 1995, you know, a lot of my green team issue stuff was still black. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. So moving right along, gloves for the day were just um, kind of your run of the mill flight crew Nomex gloves. Mm -hmm. And those stayed in vogue for a very long time. Uh, these guys were using them in either green or black. Eventually, they did come out with tan ones um, that I was able to use. But yeah, so anyway, as far as we know, those were the gloves used, um, aside from, I guess, the repelling gloves. But yeah, I'll that's just a welding glove yeah. or, you know, something thicker. Uh, boots. The boots worn by 22 SAS on the day were known as Northern Ireland boots. And those were a sturdy looking high cut combat <laughs> boot, all leather, um, rubber sole looks like. You can and stomp on some glass yeah, and, you know, yeah, definitely. kick someone's head in. Yeah, stomp, you know, glass, heads, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, whatever you got but, by today's standards, you know, definitely a very large, very heavy, very clunky boot. Um, but they were sturdy and they protected your feet. And it worked. And uh, they definitely got the job done. So, what I was kind of most impressed with was the vest. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Um, and the, you got to remember, there was no tack vests at all, you know. So, mm -hmm. they went to the, the local harness maker, basically, mm -hmm. and had bay, what, what would you would. Uh, looked a lot like a, a cut. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, a what do you know about hand. a pigskin cut? You know? <laughs> like these guys literally, you know, if you look closely at these first gen tactical vests, they're basically black leather pigskin cuts. But instead of all the patches and do ickies, they're just like attaching their flashbangs and their yeah. freaking Pouch palms. Pouches, not patches, right? You know? Yeah. Um, hell, one guy's got like, it looks like a tomahawk, you know? Mm, he does. Hooked in here. You got his, your, your knives, your flash crashes, mm, you know, your whatever. radio, your push to talk. Uh, mag pouches. And then, uh, you know, the belt had, uh, again, it, there was no magazine pouches uh, that were standard issue mm -mm. for the, uh, the MP5s. No, they had everything low. custom built out of leather. <laughs> yeah, they locally sourced all this stuff, like right there you know, in town. So you had your pistol mag pouches, your MP5 mag pouches, your holsters, uh, belts looked like just standard police belts, something <laughs> along those lines. But the, uh, the the Gen 1 pigskin cuts, like, I don't know if anybody has one of those or like, but wow. Yeah. I don't know how long 
a leather vest would last doing that job. They were replaced fairly quickly. I think it was one of the first things they got replaced. But that's a good way to be able to tell if you're looking at you know black and white imagery is were they wearing the leather jackets versus kind of the later generations? Mm -hmm. It's a, kind of a telltale sign. Whether it was, yeah, on the day or stage later for, uh, for publicity. Because you got to remember, after this successful uh, op, the, uh, the Golden Connex box opened up for these guys, and they had whatever they wanted yeah. custom made by whoever they wanted pretty mm -hmm. much from that day on. And they were already t well funded to that point, but yeah, yeah. obviously, <laughs> like it, I mean, it didn't just elevate them, it elevated everybody in that game of what was capable, because it was better than fiction. What they did, honestly, like, it was incredible. And you know, you, you, you look at the the folks running the show over here. They see that and they go, "Wow, we can do that. We need that capability too." You know, and that really fired lit a fire under uh, the the counter terrorist uh, you know mission uh, in the U.S. military. Um, these vests were lined with an early, very early kind of uh, prototype version of ceramic armor mm -hmm. and ceramic plates absolutely no helmets of any kind because nobody wore helmets back then we didn't wear helmets yeah i mean kids didn't wear helmets riding bikes i don't think they've invented bicycle helmets yet but uh all right so yeah like coach was saying there was no tactical industry yet so these guys were just designing kit to carry their equipment like on the go mm -hmm. and um it definitely varied you know i don't think any two guys in my career ever wore their gear the same way so I, how would these, why would these guys be any different? I yeah. think it was, things were very uh, modular, as we'll say. Well, I mean, there was, there's similarities in what we do now. Then they were just figuring this stuff out. Like you see some guys, they've got uh, their reloads for their, their pistol on their belt mm -hmm. or way down on, the, on their thigh next to the, uh, mm -hmm. the holster. Or one guy even had uh, one like on his wrist. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen that before. You know, if you're thinking that's fast, I don't know, might be. But yeah. we never tried that because, uh, you know, and, and you don't see a lot of it after that. So maybe it was. Well, they're just trying stuff out. And then we saw, you know, as you can see in the picture, this, though, this picture was taken after the operation based on a number of things. But you can't see the pistol, but you can see the MP5. Mm -hmm. And the MP5 is a right handed shooter. Is he one of those guys that shoots primary right handed and pistol left handed? Because those freaks do exist. <laughs> Uh, be, and the reason I bring it up is the spare mag is on his left arm. Wow. So now you transition to pistol. You needed to perform a combat reload. So the guy's confused anyway. I mean, you know, like, <laughs> maybe when that, that wasn't for speed. Maybe it was like, well, yeah. no, I just need it. So, you know, if you guys know a little bit more about it than we do, because obviously we don't, you know, you could uh, hit us up on the comments. But um, I just thought that was kind of interesting in the picture. Yeah. And again, these guys are figuring stuff out. Yeah. You know, if it worked, uh, you, we're probably still doing it today. If it didn't mm -hmm. work, then uh, it went by the wayside. Yeah. I think a lot of it was just personal preference. You would see pistol mag pouches on the thigh of the, pi the pistol holster on the thigh strap. You know, so you're, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's not the fastest. It's not the end of the world. You know, you know I'm often reaching for my uh, CCW mag that's in my watch pocket on my right side <laughs> back, you know. So, you know, it's just definitely doable. But not um, the fastest, though. No, not the fastest. Yeah, but honestly, true. you know, these guys were just figuring it all out. We know what we know because these guys figured it out and showed us. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just really awesome. Well, there's one photo in there where the guy looks like there's a, uh, he, he's got a, a tomahawk, actually, in his uh, on, he did. On, on pouch there. And you're thinking, okay, so what do you use a tomahawk for? Well, I mean, obviously, dispatching people is one thing, but you know, the breaching aspect of a tomahawk is also there, right? Because um, they didn't have the, the Halligan or Hoolian tool, um, you Joker know, at the time. Either. Yeah, I mean, we haven't seen any pictures. Yeah, we've it. seen pictures of them with Halligans, but we know that those that were taken it. after. Yeah. But they definitely had uh, other yeah. breaching equipment. Yeah, we've which seen is, sledgehammers, uh, which, you know, honestly is, you can do a lot with a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure can. <laughs> like send it right into the room. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Yeah, so they did have um, breaching equipment. Obviously, everybody saw on the news them using those um, 
frame charges. Yep. So explosive breaching for outside, uh, unaware of what they did for any kind of explosive breaching inside. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that was a thing in 1980 um, because, you know, over pressure, you, you've got to do a lot of, uh, well, trial and error and experimentation to figure out you know, the right recipe for how much explosive you can use inside a building without rocking everybody in the uh, in the train yeah so so they used definitely outside and then mechanical breaching inside um sledgehammers and there was some shotguns right the uh, 870s yes. yeah remington 870s were the shotgun um, but it was in that compact tool form i don't think any of them were running shotties as a primary weapon system no, that was more of a that. thing you saw in america <laughs> um, not so much over there, but they did have them. Also, with the framing charges, you know, obviously they knew exactly how big the windows were. They knew a lot about their target. Um, I mean, they had five days to prep on site. And it uh, looks like, you know, based on the imagery, you know, obviously that's a plastic explosive that's at 12, 3, 6, and 9 o'clock on the frame, all connected with debt core, giving you that explosive train. And, uh, I mean, I don't know, man. It looks like it uh, <laughs> like could have been that's upwards. A full M one twelve. Yeah, could have like they could have been using upwards of a yeah full M one twelve block, which is what one and a quarter pound. One and a quarter pounds of uh, of C four, which has a RE factor of one point three four. Yeah, so it's more more effective than TNT. So yeah, so you have yeah, it's one point three four times the power of dynamite. That's a lot of boom. And you watch, I mean, you can see <laughs> in the news footage, you know, that was taken, and it's a pretty legit boom. Oh, yeah. It looks like about a 112 block would do. Um, I don't know how many windows were blown out throughout the street in the cars, or not, if not, but... Uh, or even out of the building. I mean, you know, yeah. you know, the glass flew in on that one and probably out on three or four others here. And there was a hostage in one of the rooms that they blew. Thank the Lord. Yeah. He was okay. And at one point, though, uh, they had to breach with the um, with the hammers because mm -hmm. the, uh, one of their guys had got caught up in his uh, abseiling gear. Yeah. So they couldn't use explosive breaches to get in. Um, so they started bashing the windows and shooting uh, uh, the CS gas through there from the snipers, which yeah. lit the curtains on fire mm -hmm. and started that whole train. Yeah. They had to pivot. They uh, went ahead and... Uh, for when the, uh, the, the the shot things were a little bit out of sync at at the the beginning of the assault they had fired off some diversionary sh uh, shots that brought in some skylights you know just to create mayhem and confusion but yeah they instantly pivoted the team leader you know made that call they were able to cut away their guy who was uh, you know burning up pretty good but he ended up getting up and continuing yeah. the fight I mean these guys were just pad to the bone man i mean he was burned up pretty good and uh, he just got up and kept fighting mm -hmm. again attitude over skill man it'll get you there you know um and you know the, and the other thing that we can take away from that is you know you got multiple layers of breaches okay the, your breaching capability you've got explosive you've got you know your manual with mm -hmm. the hammers you got mechanical with your shotguns mm -hmm. um you know so it, and don't forget those boots. <laughs> yeah. yeah, boots work. Yeah, I was amazing. The thing the battering rams yeah. <laughs> laced to the feet. <laughs> it, 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 one of those things that we remember that we you know we look at from there that carries on to today is you don't just have one one type of breach. You, you know you're going to have a bunch of multiple mm -hmm. uh, you know capabilities uh, within your group. Redundancies. Redundancy. There you go. Yeah. So that pretty much brings us to kind of. The, you know, what we knew about what happened on that day, what they had, what they picked, you know, how it worked, you know, and, and this the capability because, you know, everybody knows that the equipment doesn't make the capability necessarily. It's the person, the type of person, their training, their dedication. But when it comes to this skill set, almost more so than any other, you know, the equipment is literally what's giving you the capability. You're just the one operating it. And, you know, this was a huge leap forward in capability mm -hmm. and really the proof of concept because the last time something like this had happened really was the munich massacre yeah you know which, which did, not, did not go well did not go well and i think in guy. the back of everybody's mind through those five you know five excruciating days leading up to day six of the takedown it was kind of a foregone conclusion that all these people were probably going to die just like last time because there were way more of them and you know 
not to take anything away from what happened before, you know, but these capabilities, these, these, this equipment, the weapon selection, all of this had just been, they had been turning and burning on trying to perfect a way to pull off for next, pull it off for next time. And they did, mm -hmm. they crushed it. Um, out of the 26 hostages, two were killed, two were wounded. They did, um, one was killed before the takedown, and then one was killed during with two additional wounded. Five out of six of the terrorists were killed during clearance. One of them was able to slip out with the uh, hostages, but they found him in the yard as they were uh, processing the hostages. And believe it or not, again, going back to how amazingly, just how incredible these guys were, one of them grabbed the dude by the hair and was dragging him back into the building so he could kill him because, you know, they were tasked with neutralizing all hostiles. Every breath a terrorist takes is might as well be a, a hostage being killed. And that's the game. So, but he wasn't able to do so because his recce guys, who he was on comms with, were able, hey man, the media's got cameras everywhere. You are on camera dragging that dude back into the building. He's like, ah! Oh! So that guy went to jail for a while and then, believe it or not. Well, 27 years. Yeah, yeah not long but, enough. And then they, they uh, paroled him. They paroled him and he has to live under an assumed identity in England because obviously the Iranians would peel his skin off. <laughs> So guys, uh, we hope you like this. I mean, we didn't get into the minute by minute, you know, timeline stuff. There's been multiple documentaries that had a way bigger budget than us mm -hmm. that have gone through that. We just want to jump into, you know, the attitudes of the men that were doing this, the gear that they had at the time, and kind of compare that a little bit to what yeah, our era. Yeah. You know? And we're going to do this more with, uh, with, with some more um, topics. And if you've got one that you like, you know, you know, you've got a suggestion, put in the comments because, uh, you know, we're going to do more of these depending on how much you like them. All right, guys. Thanks for being here with us. It's uh, Doran Coach out.